this. <laughs> we rolling everybody? Scott? Could be wrong. That camera may be pointed in the wrong direction. It looks maybe it's fine. It looks like it's pointing. Kelly is, is pointing over here. Okay. All right, uh, this is Romans, class number 58, so let's turn to Hebrews 11. Well, the truth is we've been talking about faith uh, from the book of Romans and faith in relationship to the cross. And um, um, I want to just uh, read you a scripture here, Hebrews 11, 11. Uh, that maybe you can see what we've been talking about with, with the faith of Abraham and the faith that, that it took uh, to be justified, to be justified. Hebrews 11, 11 says this, through faith also Sarah herself received strength, received it. She didn't muster it up. She didn't call on the little bit of resources she got. She received strength to conceive seed, okay? So what does this speak of? Well, let me just make sure. Anne was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised, and this word faithful is, there is still the word faith, but it is, um, one, of the, one of the main things that you find in the scriptures in relationship to faith, if you examine it closely in the New, New Testament, is that you will find that Faith is actually in the faithfulness of God to what he said he would do. And he fulfilled everything by the cross. That's right. He fulfilled. And so it is not just some magical thing that we have when we exercise faith. It is, it is faith in God's faithfulness and therefore faith in the work of the cross. So I want to I wanna just recover a little bit that we've already shared, kind of a little bit of a summary, and then move on from here. So this subtopic is called Faith is Forever Tied to the Cross. Though we've covered this in the past, it might be good to remind everyone of the strong relationship between faith and the cross. In Philippians 3.10, when Paul talks about faith and not law as his means, he immediately ties that to him being connected to Jesus and the cross. His faith rests in the belief that the power of his resurrection, Jesus' resurrection, or your resurrection, as it were, is equal to conformity to his death. And maybe I'll just turn there just to make sure that you know what we're talking about. So uh, Philippians 3. And I will tell you this, and, and uh, we've covered it somewhat in Philippians class before, but Philippians 3 is nothing more than the reenactment of Philippians 2 where Jesus gives himself on a certain basis and Paul in Philippians 3 is doing the same thing, reenacting the cross by the living Christ who gives himself in him. And here uh, in verse... Um, that's it. Uh, verse 9. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law. Okay, so, so what is that saying just that? It's saying that the, that the law only establishes your own righteousness and not God's. Okay? And uh, you, you certainly get that out of the book of uh, Romans chapter 10 full of that right there, just that right there. Um, but he goes on to say, uh, verse 
9 still, which is uh, his own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Um, and he's basically saying that this is the system, I'm going to just say it like that, this is the system I operate by instead of law. Well, that was a question that all the Jews would want to know. What, what system are you operating by? Are you operating by Moses? No, I'm operating by Jesus. Are you operating by the law? No, I'm operating, and if you notice the wording there is um, not that which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. That which is through the faith of Christ. And in Galatians 2.20, he said, I live by the faith of the Son of God. And that faith is described as who loved me by giving himself for me. Okay? Who loved me by giving himself for me. I live by the faith of Christ who loved me by giving himself for me. And that's the reason I live this way. And they would say, what way do you live? I live, but not I. Christ lives in me. I don't live, as a matter of fact. Okay. So, so the faith is always tied to the cross. Um, uh, his faith rests in the belief that the power of his resurrection is equal to conformity to his death. So you drop down to verse 10. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, and being made conformable to his death. So we say, well, there's three things there, though. There's not just one. There's the power of his resurrection. There's fellowship of his suffering. Then there's the, his death. But none of those except one does he say, I want to conform to. In other words, his goal in conformity was to conform to his death. And from that death, in, to the degree of that death, would be the power of his resurrection the amount of his resurrection. Um, and he says after that, conformity to his death, if by any means I might attain to the resurrection. Conformable to his death, if by any means I may be um, uh, attain, not conform, but attain the resurrection. Uh, the apostle points out there is an attaining to the resurrection of the dead. There's an attaining to it. Okay, well, we say, what do I got to do to attain to the resurrection of the dead? What do I got to do? Well, you got to be dead. You know, that's the first thing. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, that's how that works. It's a, you know, we make everything so complicated, and we don't see the simplicity of some of these things sometimes. It's like, I never saw. I, I, all the places I go, I hear people say on a regular basis, you know, I've never heard anybody put it that way. And I said, well, is that, but is that the way the scriptures read it? And, the, you know, the response is usually, or at least from those who speak, is that, well, it was explained to me that, you know, well, you know, it was explained to me that way too. But some, somebody here, somebody here, somebody on Skype, somebody has to break with that and say, you know what? I'm going to the Word, and I'm going to just ask the Holy Spirit to be my teacher. And that doesn't mean, because the Bible says, you know, you have teachers, and you don't have many fathers, but you have that, and you have, you know, da-da-da-da. But we don't, we don't make human being teachers the ultimate end. Not me, not anybody. You know, I mean, if I was that good, then I would depend on me, and I don't. <laughs> So there you have it, you know. I know about this guy. So I know I better get with the Lord. <clears throat> so that means that the idea of resurrection is not a standalone concept. Right? It's not a standalone con concept. It is, there is no just resurrection. To attain to it will require specific means. That chosen method involved being himself made 
conformable to Jesus' death. Okay. So he's talking about the resurrection. He mentions it several times in these scriptures. He's talking about resurrection, but he's talking about the way to get to that is not just being dead physically. Well, I'm, I'm a Christian, so if I die physically, there's going to be a resurrection. But he doesn't put it like that. And he does it over in Romans in chapter 6 and any of that. He never puts it on that basis of, well, once you're a Christian, if you just die, then resurrection. If you physically die, resurrection. He said, I want to be made conformable to Jesus' death. Know ye not that as many as us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Like as Christ was raised from the dead, even so you should walk in new life, which is him, the resurrection. But you don't get, neither one of those scriptures are like what we think. It, the death there is not us just being a Christian and then physically dying and getting raised. It's also not, the resurrection is not me being raised, but Christ as my resurrection. And if you want to, if you really want to nail down a resurrection, how about Ephesians, the first chapter, where it says that we were raised up and made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Okay, so that when raised up, made to sit together, there was a we were we were put to death together, and it says that in the previous scripture there in Ephesians, together, and we're raised together so that our true resurrection is not us on any basis other than Christ. And you say, other than Christ being the resurrect, resurrector? You know, no, no. It is Christ being our resurrection, and you say, well then, are we raised or not? Yeah, in him. But actually, no. I mean, it's like, it's like if I had this Bible and, I, and there was an elevator right here and I wanted it to go up, I could throw that Bible on there and it'd go up. But if, if this piece of paper was me and I put it in there and I threw it in there and it went up, really, the Bible, I, it was the Bible that went up and was raised and I just happened to be in it when that happened. See? But we're, we're, oh, I'm going to be resurrected. Oh, I can't wait for the resurrection one day. Well, you know, you've been waiting when it's not necessary. And so someone always inevitably says to me, well, Brother Randy, are you saying that there ain't going to be no physical resurrection? You know, I, to be honest with you, I don't care if there is or not. But, yeah, I personally believe there will be. But I still believe that's a physical manifestation of a spiritual truth. I'm sorry, that's what I believe. I believe that, that it is, but it isn't. It isn't in itself. It's, it doesn't stand alone. Resurrection on any form doesn't stand alone. It is a physical manifestation of what is true in the spirit and, of, and then so in the soul where, where we are, as it were, have the resurrection dwelling in us and then physically there's your manifestation of that reality. But, you know, for the most part, in most places I go, or a lot of the places, I don't even get into all of that. I just, because what's important? Jesus has the resurrection is what's important. Or I could say, Jesus is always the most important thing. I'm sorry. I'm, you know, and I, I've been accused. Well, you know, I've, I've had a guy, a pastor catch me after a conference I was doing in Nicaragua, I think it was, I can't remember. and. He said, all you, have, all you do is, is talk about Jesus. There's other stuff in the Bible. And I said, you think, you think God's going to get on me? You know, I mean, you know, <laughs> don't, you talk about, you know, Father, you talk about Jesus too much. You think he's going to do that? <laughs> I don't think he is, you know. And, uh, and I do believe in all sorts of things. You can't be a pastor and not believe that, you know, all sorts of things and issues you have to deal with and this and that and whatever. But I, I believe you leave the circumference out of it, I mean the, the center out of it, then the circumference has no, it's, it's like, a, it's like a, a wagon wheel 
the, the spokes are broken out and it takes the, the center out of it that holds it to the hub and it's useless. It, well, I got the circumference. I got it, you know. It goes round and round. Not on that wagon, it don't. It's not going to take you where you want to go. You can push it if you'd like, you know, like a little kid. I'm sorry. <clears throat> In the surrounding verses, Paul seeks a righteousness based on faith. But the specific area his faith is pointed toward and that he emphasizes is the area of being conformed to his death. For him, faith is tied to death and resurrection and not as some means of obtaining a new house or abundant finances or material blessings. His faith involved that of being conformed to Jesus and his death. And so um, you, you see in, you know, I don't have the time, you, you, and I've spent my whole life doing it. You can go through the scriptures and find so many deaths that were conformable to his death that had power. You know, just off the cuff, Samson. Samson's, Samson's got all this strength. It's the Holy Spirit comes on him. He does all this stuff. It's powerful. He defeats all these enemies and stuff. But he never really gets rid of the, 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 the beast, as it were. And so... You know, one day he gets his eyes put out and his hair cut and everything, and they tie him up and they're mocking him, and all of the leaders, all of the top people are there in that Colosseum. And it's not no longer that kind of strength. The Holy Spirit doesn't come on him. He says, Lord, just let, you know, let me die like this. And when he does, it's not suicide. He defeats all of the top Philistine leaders. Okay. Why did that work and nothing else worked? Well, first of all, nothing else was really about his death. Nothing was being conformed to his death. It was just, well, I'll die one day and I don't even think about in any way, shape, or form conforming to his death, whether it's, whether it's, you know. I mean, I, I, I'll just use Kelly as an example. When she got up here and said something about, you know, this cancer is nothing. This is, I've got something in me and whatever and da-da-da-da. That was a form of conforming to his death because she was not just saying, oh, I could die from this or, you know, all this kind of stuff. She was going, man, I, I want anything that's, you know, not Jesus out. Okay. So, we, so what does that mean? That means we can, we can conform to his death tons of times a day, but it's going to take... It's going to take a real reality of his death and not just going, okay, well, I'm going to, I'm going to do without sugar at this meal, and I, I'm going to call that <laughs> for me to his death or something, you know. <clears throat> um, for him, faith is tied to death and resurrection. Okay, I already said that. All right, so again, I'm retracing some of the ground that we've covered here. As stated at the beginning, our faith is not just in God in a general way, but related to the concept of life out of death as our belief system. Okay. Did y'all hear what I just said? It's about life out of death as our belief system. And it started with the big one. The big one. You don't get saved. You don't, you don't find the true and living God unless you go here first. Is that right? That's where you go. And you go there and you find that someone, you know, ultimately, I mean, you may not find that when you first get saved, but you find that someone believed, talking about Jesus, someone believed that instead of taking all of my power as God and destroying every enemy and knocking down every obstacle and showing these people who really has the power, I'm going to die on a cross for what they should have died for. And I'm going to do it selflessly. 
And whether we re realize it or not, even in initial salvation, we're believing in life out of death. That's what it, that's what it is. Okay. So, it all expands from there. So as stated at the beginning, our faith is not just in God in a general way, but related to the concept of life out of death as our belief system. In Romans, we have seen the importance of first embracing God's concept, embracing just the concept. Okay, so let's, let's wrap the concept in a little, a little package here, you know, and, uh, you know, that way we've got it, you know, We've got it conceptualized. And so here it is. We've got, we've, got, we've got the faith related to life out of death in this little package. And it's a concept. You have to conceptualize it first. Or you don't even know. You know what I mean? You, there, you don't even know what you believe. If you never do that, you'll claim, well, I believe... You know, I believe in this cross stuff. Well, what do you mean by cross stuff? Can you give me a short outline? Can you, can you give me a, a bullet list? Can you, well, you know, uh, I, you know, Jesus died and I died with him. And, okay, where's your faith in that? Oh, no, my faith goes back to simple salvation, but I'm just saying, there's more. Folks, Simple salvation faith is the faith all the way through. It just is expanded to understand the fullness of what God is trying to work out in his own body, in us. Okay? So it's not, it's not, let me just say this right clear, okay? It's not that we believe that you get saved and there's simple salvation and then maybe you get the charismatic gifts and stuff like that and then that's a progression and then maybe if you're lucky you know you get into <clears throat> what some people call deeper life which is the teaching of the cross and then but you don't really need that to be saved <laughs> it's that principle that saved you you can you all see that it's that's what saved you so you're not leaving anything. You're not separating it all up and saying, well, there's this simple thing and then there's all this other stuff. And, you know, yes, I agree. Not, maybe everyone doesn't fully recognize the depth of that cross at salvation and stuff and where it leads and what God expects of us or hopes for us of, of having his nature to be able to, to, to lay down our lives for one another. But it's still there. And it's still the backbone of what he did and what he meant and what he, um, what he hopes for. And I'll even say it like this. He expects it. I mean, even the word hope can be translated expectation. It can be. Am I right, Melon? Yeah, can be. Which I knew it, but mouth of two or three witnesses. <laughs> but God expects it. Why? Why? Because God has expectations that He puts on us, and He's unfair, and you know, He just you no. Know, because He's given us His Son, and and if we really receive Him the way we should, even in the simple faith then that's going to manifest in us eventually. So he's expecting it. He's not, he is not expecting this to go nowhere. He kind of got that with the Jews. You know, so he goes, okay, well, let's, let's dump this Christian thing and let's come up with another plan. Do you, now he did it with the Jews, so do you believe he could do it with us? No, he can't because it's all based in his son. Now, now we may miss the mark, but it doesn't, it, you know, all of that doesn't mean we're not saved because that's the whole heart of it. He gave himself for us. Does that make sense? 
He gave himself so that you wouldn't have to go to hell and da da da. But that wasn't the main reason why he gave himself. He gave himself so that once Christ begins to be formed in you, you don't even have to deal with all those issues. Or not like most people who are struggling. There, there, are, there are many Christians who are giving little or no attention to the kingdom realities of God because they're too busy fighting off the world and the flesh and the devil down here in their little circle, you know? <clears throat> okay. In Romans, we have seen the importance of first embracing God's concept of what we have termed his cross method. Okay, so let's, let's consider the cross in light of first just a concept of it being the cross method. Now, you know, I don't believe we have, you have to go to all these places, but I think it helps to understand things, you know, that you conceptualize the cross as more than just an event, and that's the important thing. It's more than an event. It is God's cross method for us and everybody. Okay? So it's like, all right, now I'm seeing this as not just something Jesus did, 2,000 years ago and it's finished and it's done for us and now we get all the benefits. Rather, I'm looking at the cross and I'm seeing that this is his method. This is God. If you understand what I mean, not that the wood and all that stupid stuff, you know, but, but this way of proceeding is God. But if we don't relate to him as God, what are we, what are we relating to him? On what basis? on a basis that's false. It could be a fa like a false image we have of him. It could be an idol. Beware of idols, little children. Didn't John say that? But he wasn't talking about pieces of wood and all that kind of stuff. He's talking about conceptualizing God on a basis of, well, he looked down and saw that we were in trouble and he decided he's going to fix this thing once and for all and he came down here and he just did it. Well, yeah, the sin question, it's a finished work. But guess what? Christ formed in you, the scripture is full of that, that that's not finished. If You know what? If it's finished when Jesus died on the cross, he would have no reason to send back the Holy Spirit. Well, it's finished. Y'all act like you won. It'll just, it'll kick in. I was correct to choose this one. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to read that last part. In Romans, we have, seen, we have seen the importance of first embracing God's concept of what we term the cross method. This is fundamental. You got you to gotta conceptualize it before it's ever gonna just start working by life, by Christ's life in you, you're not even gonna know what he expects. You know, you'd say, well, I've, and I hear, I've seen this because I travel with a lot of groups that teach Christ in you. And I've seen one group and they say, well, Christ in you is that, I've heard this, Christ in you is that uh, Christ is in you as you. Okay, first time I heard that, I was kind of going, uh, and that's what they didn't just teach Christ in you. They caught, they taught Christ in you as you. And you know, it was like, okay, yeah. I was having a hard time figuring out what that meant until uh, a gay person got up there, and he says, "Yeah, it's Christ in me as me, and you know, this is the way Jesus manifests through me." And I'm going, basically, you're just calling Christ you and doing what you want to do. We, you know, if you don't understand the, the principle of the concept that life comes out of death, then guess what? You'll preach life and you'll call it Christ, but there'll be no death. And then it's just you. And, you know, the Pharisees would have liked that. Well, it's just me. But those outcasts and everything that followed Jesus felt like they needed something more and that's why they followed Jesus <clears throat> in that concept 
we must see that Christ crucified was not just an event, but was the nature by which God, by which the crucified operates at all times. Okay, the nature. It's not just an event. It is the nature by which he operates all the time. It seems to me like I taught a class on the Gospels and I literally went through the Gospels and pointed out time after time Jesus laying down his life that you wouldn't normally see it. You would just see events, events, events. Well, I'm reading events. Oh, this, that, that, that. But you, then all of a sudden you see, you know, when you really look at it, you start seeing Jesus, you know, uh, you know, news comes that John the Baptist's head is cut off. Jesus goes up in the mountain to pray and just be alone because that was his, not only his relative, but it was his God-given um, forerunner. A um, bunch of people gathered up down there and the disciples go, all the people are hungry, get up, we need you, we need you, Jesus, get up, get up, forget your problems, don't, you know, we don't have time for you to have stuff, come on, get up and let's go, and let's go help everybody and da 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 da. Jesus gets up and does it, never says a word, never says anything, never says, I need to spend time with my father. Or, don't y'all have any idea of what this means to me? Well, no, you're God. <laughs> you're God. Everything's cool with you. We're the ones with the problems. Come on, help us. See, same, that same old spirit. That same old spirit, constantly. Anyway, I went through the Gospels and just showed time after time after time stuff that related to, the, to his selfless giving. But those people didn't see it. You know why? Because if you're selfish, you normally don't see selfless giving in someone else. You don't. You know why? Why? Because you're so concerned with yourself, you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't notice it at all. It's like, oh, I like this person. Well, why do you like them? Well, you know, I don't know, I just like them. Well, maybe you like them because they're always laying down their, their life for you and you're getting your way. Hello? Okay. So what, would you, what should those who lay down their life uh, constantly while these others get their way, what should they do? They should rise up and slaughter these people. The, for those that are on Skype and couldn't hear the laughter, that was a joke. Um, but that's what, that's what someone feels like doing when they see the injustice of it instead of seeing it as, this is what I do. This is my nature. I'm one with God. I'm one with Jesus. This is what we're going to do. And that's what Jesus did when he lived on this earth. That's what he did. That's the way he walked. He gave himself in that way. And, you know, never you know, really, you know, talked about himself and said, well, you know, here's my situation and this is unfair or whatever. Was it unfair? Yes. Uh, was it abuse from their part, but not to the Lord? You know, if it's nature, it's not abuse, folks. If it's concept alone, it can be abuse. Is that right? Because it's just a concept and you go, well, I'll lay down my life, and there's this glorious rose-colored vision of everybody recognizing that you're the, you're the Lamb of God incarnate. You're the one that really lays down your life, and that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. People aren't... It, we're going to get into it pretty soon, but I mean, the very nature of God can't allow it to happen like that because if he does you'll you'll do that stuff for the glory that will you know people will give you once they begin to see it instead of just you know and that's what jesus said another example i mean jesus says okay well you know um 
when you pray, you know, don't be like the Pharisees who stand on the corner and they cry out and they pray and they make all these great declarations of, you know, oh God, you know. He says, go into your closet and pray where nobody can see you and nobody can give you a reward and your father will give you a reward then on, you know, on that day. Okay, so it's, you know, why would I want to do that if nobody sees, you know, what's the point of that? You know, the only reason why I'm involved in church is so everybody will see what I do. I want people to applaud me or think I'm spiritual or, or um, uh, equate me with Jesus when it's not. Well, that's, I'd call that dangerous, you know. Because then you're really, I mean, you know, the Lord won't do anything if you're doing that with him, abusing him in that way, but the Holy Spirit might. And that's just a thought. I'm not going to get into that, but there's good stuff on that. Um, second, we have examined the fact that if God's cross method is embraced, then we will submit and succumb to it whereby we will enter in by faith to the reality of our own crucifixion in order that Christ may now function as our life, okay? So we will submit and succumb to it, meaning we submit at first, which is using our will, we succumb to it when the cross has cut deep enough to take us down, amen? But if you never see that, if you never seek that, you know, and who would want to seek that? I mean, honestly, who wants to seek that? So, so the answer has to be because he's not going to—he's not going to force that on anybody, because that would be forcing himself on somebody. He's not going to—he's not going to force that. Okay. So, he his desire is that someone will look past all of this self-centered Christianity that we do. Now, I'm not pointing out there. I'm talking about me and, and then you and then you know us and then all of that and we'll say you know I mean it, okay. thank you Holy Spirit okay you got the ten lepers okay they all come to Jesus heal us Lord heal us he says well go show yourself to your high priest and you'll be healed because that was the right order you say oh Jesus is legalistic He's, he's telling them to do something according to the law. No, no, the law has a spirit behind it, and the spirit behind it was you go to the high priest who's already laid down his life and who's already um, uh, entered in for you so that you don't have to be slaughtered. So they go, and out of the ten of them, one of them goes, man, you know, because they were healed as they went, though. Because they had seen their high priest, Jesus. And one of them turns back and he goes, or he, th he, he had to think. Don't you, don't you think that? He had to think something. And I think that it was something like this. What are we doing? This is the guy that, that has really healed us. And here we're going to go on and we're going to, we're going to be all right and we're going to start living happily and we're going to live joyfully and never give him another thought. And I'm going back right now and I'm going to, I'm going to put this in order in my head that he deserves my heart. He deserves my honor. He deserves it. Okay. So he does that. And you know the rest of the story comes back healed and Jesus said go and be made whole because you have taken a step away from yourself and away from the crowd I, I got a feeling you know have you ever seen homeless people that are congregated somewhere they all know one another you know and hey you know and it's like you know they, they do have a family in that sense well I, I got a feeling lepers did the same thing because they were the only ones they could hang out with this guy had to leave his family for Jesus. Oh, come on with us, man. It's going to be great. No, you know what? I got to go. I got to go. All right. So, 
So I think it's a hard thing that the Lord's looking for, and I really believe that. I believe, I believe it with all my heart. I believe it that He is, He's wanting our heart. I'm glad I felt my chest here. This is for you from Deb. She needs a copy of this stuff tonight. It is a hard thing where the Lord something of, and it has to be initiated by the Holy Spirit in some way, but we have to respond. We have free will. Does that make sense? The Holy Spirit can, he moves on people all the time, and I think people don't even know it. You know, maybe he says, well, why don't we do so and so, and then we turn to somebody and say, I just had a good thought. <laughs> you know, he goes, hey. And it's so the opposite of God, the way they operate. So, um, catch. <clears throat> but when the Holy Spirit can finally start turning somebody's heart and it says, you know what, this isn't all about you. This is, this is meant to bring you to a place, like in the Song of Solomon, where you begin to turn to him, where you begin, your motivations are no longer about what you can get. And in quote unquote, following him, you're gonna suffer things that you wouldn't have followed if you put self first because your putting self first would have avoided those things, right? Because self, you know, you know, that's just the way it is. So, and I, you know, I mean, there's, there's period of times where I've had to go through all kind of trouble and all kind of junk, and you know, I've, some I bring on myself, but, but some of it, I would look and I would just think about it, and I'd go, you know, if I wasn't so committed to Jesus, I wouldn't have these problems. I mean, if I just went to a church and just sat in a pew in the back or something, you know, I wouldn't have these kind of problems. But then you go, I'm in love, you know. I'm in love. I'm in love with Jesus. And I can't not, I cannot not be with him. And so it's like, it's like a, it's like an angry father or stepfather that gets mad at a little kid and and, uh, you know, for no reason, but, you know, he's been drunk or whatever. So he gets mad at a little kid, and he gets his, you know, his, his belt, razor strap, and he, he starts to beat him, he hits him once, and the mom throws herself over the top of him like this and covers him. And bam, bam, get out of the way, bam, get out of the way. And she says, no, you can, you can go all night long if you want. But I'm, this is what I'm going to do. And, you know, why, why would you bear that? Why would you take those, those stripes for somebody else? Well, Jesus took them for us, didn't he? In a real way. He actually really did. You know, we kind of we read it as a story. But if you look at that and you say, that, you did that for me, Jesus. I mean, you really... You know, it really hits you. You, you did that for me, because you love me. Then you would love him forever. And, you know, why would the mother do that? Because she loves her child, and she thinks, you know, I'm older. I can handle this. I mean, to some degree. But this little child doesn't know what's going on. You know. Well, you know, I believe that. Love is as strong as death. I mean, I believe it's, it's stronger, but it is the same thing with God. Love and death go together with him. By this perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his love, because he died, because he, you know, lost his life for us. Okay. But then again, why did he do that and why do we do what we do? Because of faith. We believe life comes out of death if it's selfless and it's not about me. We believe that. And so we say, hit me again if you want, you know. I mean, didn't anybody ever, and I'm sorry, I'm kind of getting off on some of the stuff here, but didn't anybody ever like look at, 
my Joan of Arc and a ton of other people, you know, um, like when they were being burned at the stake, you know, and deny the Lord, deny this, this heresy that you believe and stick with the Catholic Church. And if you don't, then we're going to light this fire and you're going you're gonna to burn to death. And you hear stories of that and you, you hear stories that, you know, they, didn't, they weren't screaming out or whatever. Some were singing or, or praying or, um, uh, and, and a good example of that, I mean, if, from the Bible is Stephen where they're literally stoned, I mean, hitting him with rocks. You, it, you know, they're not little pebbles, you know. Well, Jesus, I just, oh, go ahead, pebble me if you want. You know, it wasn't like that, man. There, bam, blood going on and everything. And he's still, it, it's like unbroken communion. As he's looking up and he sees Jesus, at the right hand of God. And he says the same thing basically Jesus said, Father, forgive them. Okay, so, so we know at least if we believe the Bible is true that it is possible for people to be burned at the stake or this or that or whatever. But I mean, I, I used to wonder, now how did those people, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm too weird. But I'm going, how come then I'm going, Oh, Jesus, ow, ow, Jesus, Jesus. oh, oh, yeah, Jesus, that's my mind. But I'm going to say, you know, because I'm thinking that's fire, that stuff hurts, you know. But, but I know how they did it, and I know how Stephen did it. If your eyes are on the Lord, you walk on water, but you also can take stones. But if your eyes are not on the Lord, you just look at the angry mob and say, this is, this is wrong. That's what you do. That's what you do. And you will do that. I promise you, you'll do that. And you'll do it until the day happens where um, you have seen the Lord in such a way that you understand that this concept has now become a nature and it's called the Lamb of God. And this is what I live by. This is my faith. What's your faith? Jesus. My faith is in Jesus. Your faith is in and Jesus who died for your sins? Yes, but now it's worked down into me. And my faith is in this, li this, this life that gives himself in death. And therefore, this death is not in vain. It is not in vain. It will bring forth fruit. Well, let's just try a little bit here. Once those things have taken place, then we're ready to see what living by God's cross method means in a personal way of approaching things. Once believed, then this faith leads you to take certain outward actions based on that embrace of your death with Christ. It causes you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Where's that? Romans 12, verse 1, or thereabout. And not... It causes you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice and not present you as one. Okay, that's, a, that's tricky. That's tricky. By then, it causes you to present your bodies a living sacrifice when you've gotten to that point and not present you as one. Why not? Because you're already dead. By the time you get to this point, Christ is your life, and he is your nature, and therefore you can present your body in these situations. Does that make sense? If not, you're going to protect your body. If not, like, you know, Stephen, you're going you're to grab somebody next to you and use them as a human shield because you're going to protect your body. It's just the way, it's just the way we are. Um, but the cross begins to capture every part, all the way down to your body. Jesus pointed out that the kingdom is like leaven, that it, uh, that it takes over. That's Matthew 13, 33. At that point in the progression, you begin to exist as a vessel or as his instrument through which means Paul declares us to be servants of Christ. Romans 12, 
1 through 2, and also Romans 6, 13. Aren't you glad all these, these references are coming out of Romans? Yeah. We cease existing merely as a Christian whom God must take care of and begin to be motivated toward God and others. Yeah. Uh, Romans 12, 1 through 2. All right, let's uh, take a break while I mark this and we'll come back for the next class momentarily.